seeking to expand upon his success in San Francisco, rock impresario Bill Graham decided to bring the Fillmore experience to the East Coast. But it was more than just a simple transplant. With grand New York style, he opened a theater that was arguably the greatest rock venue of all time. Great sound, great lights, great music. And anyone who ever attended a show there would never forget it. I saw The Who there, and I saw The Doors there. Uh, I went to Mountain, played there for a, a week of Christmas, and I went about four times to see Mountain. It was the first place that people probably discovered Joni Mitchell, Laura Nero, Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young. Some of the best shows we ever did were at the uh, Fillmore East in New York City. A venue is like a picture frame. Like the Fillmore East was a beautiful frame. It's a nice old theater. A good frame is really important to a painting. The same is true with an artist on stage. The Fillmore was a great frame. Bill Graham opened the Fillmore East in 1968. Unlike the ballroom setting of the Fillmore in San Francisco, he chose an ornate old movie theater as his East Coast venue. While it was open, its marquee would read like a who's who of 60s era rock music. Unfortunately, it's a temple that no longer stands. Like the ruins of a vanquished empire, only its upper facade remains. Today, people pass unknowingly through what was once the entrance to a grand temple of rock. Where I'm standing now is Second Avenue and Sixth Street. It's the most famous corner in the history of New York rock and roll. The audience would line up down the street here, down Sixth Street, and they come into the Fillmore East, which was over here, and that's where the Fillmore East actually was. The famous marquee came out, and people would enter through there. Next door to the Fillmore is this very important place. I have my hand on what was the Tisch School of the Arts in 1968, filled with very bright people who had studied theater and were gonna go into theater and had all the theater skills. Now I have my hand on what was to become the Fillmore East. And these two buildings share a common wall that goes all the way halfway to, the, to Third Avenue. It's amazing. And what happened was that as this scene began to develop, very quickly word got over here. It only had to travel six inches. And it got over here, and the young graduate students and people who were here started to come over here after class. And after a while, they didn't go back. And so the reason the Fillmore was such a powerful performance space is because everybody working here was trained in the theater. In New York, Bill Graham and his staff presented rock music with a quality and formality that was unheard of at the time. There were two shows nightly, complete with uniformed ushers, playbills, and intermissions. Even the use of a light show, a mainstay of his West Coast venue, was transformed to fit the theatrical proscenium setting. In New York, it was a theater with reserved seats. Completely different discipline, because people can't wander away. They're forced to look straight ahead. So we took the responsibility for their eyeballs from the moment they arrived until the moment they closed the house. We'd show cartoons, we'd have funny slides, and when the band was introduced, their name came up, and the first note of music, there was a visual, and the second note of music, there was a different visual, and, it, and, and then we would listen and make things happen. It just made for an amazing presentation of rock and roll, and that's what Bill Graham wanted. He wanted to show rock and roll at its highest, level, not only the music, but the visual presentation and the, and the efficiency of not having to wait for an hour between, between bands. It's just great rock and roll theater. The shows at the Fillmore East usually featured three acts on every bill. Bill Graham would do his best to make every evening a unique entertainment experience. He loved to play with the billing. Like to have like Led Zeppelin, Woody Herman, and Richie Havens. Blue Cheer with the Soul Survivors and uh, Sly and the Family Stone. It was these crazy bills. He loved to do that. Just have the most bizarre bills he could come up with. But not for their bizarreness, but to educate the audience. And that educated New York audience soon became known as one of the most demanding in rock and roll. 
You were more under a microscope when you worked at the Fillmore East. It just seemed like New York expected more and knew more about what you were doing, whether they did or not. That was the aura of that city. Even though you didn't know these thousands of other people sitting next to you were sitting around you, you, you kind of felt spiritually like you knew them, and you felt like you were a group of kindred spirits. More often than not, the bands would live up to the expectations of the Fillmore crowd. Its magical atmosphere would encourage musicians to reach new heights. The thing about the Fillmore East was we could play all night. There was no curfews on the East Coast. In most other halls, there was always curfews. Yeah, it was great at, at the uh, Fillmore East because you could play until noon if you wanted to. You know, we damn near did a couple of times. <laughs> Fillmore East would soon develop a mystique that would attract the attention of those outside the rock world. Leonard Bernstein came to the Fillmore to see a concert, and he was being given a tour backstage, and he was shown the Joshua Light Show. We were hanging off the back wall, and he wanted to try running a liquid projection plate. So we set him up and said, ready maestro and he said yes and I turned it on and he proceeded to perform and he had a, a great time. The backstage was a nut house. I mean I remember Frank Zappa, rest in peace, uh, on the stairs with two young ladies and what was going on I really can't repeat but it, Talking I mean I was on and my fondling. way to my tr trombone to warm up and I just Amidst all the music and hijinks, Bill Graham was busy building a rock and roll empire, and his notorious temper kept people from getting in his way. I remember sitting out in the outer office, and I heard Bill on the phone, and he was screaming at somebody on the telephone, and I heard him say something to the effect of, well, that's it, you're off of my Christmas list, and slamming down the phone. And I kind of slid down in the seat and said, oh my God, I hope he doesn't come, I hope he doesn't come walking out of that office, because it was just this burst of fury. Mike said, no, but Mike said he didn't mind people coming in. You don't want him? No, okay. I don't want him in here. Okay, well, it's very simple. But after the national exposure of events like Woodstock in 1969, more and more rock acts became interested in the business side of music. Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young at the Fillmore East seemed to typify growing rock star demands. Bill Graham would come and he would knock on the door and say, they're not leaving, you've got to come back and do some more. And we go, look, we've just done three hours, come on, give us a break, you know. So I think it was Crosby said, we want money. And Bill Graham starts to feed $100 bills under the door. And when he got to, I think, eight, Neil said, OK, we'll do one more song. The change in the rock and roll scene made it difficult for the 2,600-seat theater to compete with the arena-sized audiences that top acts were now willing to play to. With the writing on the wall, Bill Graham decided to preemptively pull the plug on his Fillmore operations in the summer of 1971. There's a part of me that thinks that Bill was just tired. And you know, booking both coasts and running back and running back and forth, and he may have needed, he may have needed a rest and he may have needed to back off a little bit. Sometimes I'm... Graham closed the Fillmore East with the same grand style that he opened it, booking a series of concerts with some of his favorite bands. You know, there was, there was that kind of sadness that it was the closing of the Fillmore, but at the same time, let's make it a night to remember. The departure of the Fillmore East marked the end of an era for the New York rock scene. But if you go to the corner of 2nd Avenue and 6th Street today, you'll find that it's not been completely forgotten. And if you stand there and listen, perhaps you'll be able to feel the vibes of the grandest rock temple of them all. In the movie, The Field of Dreams, an apparition whispers, if you build it, they will come. 
Now, is that what happened to Sam Phillips or Barry Gordy or Bill Graham or Hilly Crystal? Probably not. These men were visionaries who had an open ear for a new sound. They understood that it was time for a new direction in music, and they were willing and able to provide a place for that music to grow. Today, we might ask, are there any such visionaries out there in the current music business? And if so, in what ordinary places are they laying the groundwork for the future temples of rock?